The hero of the Yukon in the younger days before the Carmack strike, Burning Daylight now became the hero of the strike. The story of his hunch and how he wrote it was told up and down the land. Certainly he had ridden it far and away beyond the boldest, for no five of the luckiest held the value in claims that he held. And furthermore, he was still riding the hunch and with no diminution of daring. The wise ones shook their heads and prophesied that he would lose every ounce he had won. He was speculating, they contended, as if the whole country was made of gold, and no man could win who played a placer strike in that fashion. On the other hand, his holdings were reckoned as worth millions, and there were men so sanguine that they held the man a fool who coopered any bet daylight laid. Behind his magnificent free-handedness and careless disregard for money were hard practical judgment, imagination and vision, and the daring of the big gambler. He foresaw what with his own eyes he had never seen, and he played to win much or lose all. There's too much gold here in Bonanza to be just a pocket, he argued. It is sure come from a mother load somewhere, and other creeks will show up. Y'all you keep your eyes on Indian River. The creeks that drain that side of the Klondike watershed are just as likely to have gold as the creeks that drain this side. And he backed this opinion to the extent of grub-staking half a dozen parties of prospectors across the big divide into the Indian River region. Other men, themselves failing to stake on Lucky Creek, he put to work on his Bonanza claims, and he paid them well. Sixteen dollars a day for an eight-hour shift, and he ran three shifts. He had grub to start them on, and when, on last the water, the Bella arrived loaded with provisions, he traded a warehouse site to Jack Kearns for a supply of grub that lasted all his men through the winter of 1896. And that winter, when famine pinched and flour sold for two dollars a pound, he kept three shifts of men at work on all four of the Bonanza claims. Other mine owners paid fifteen dollars a day to their men, but he had been the first to put men to work, and from the first he paid them a full ounce a day. One result was that his were picked men, and they more than earned their higher pay. One of his wildest plays took place in early winter after the freeze-up. Hundreds of stampeders, after staking on other creeks than Bonanza, had gone on disgruntled downriver to Forty Mile and Circle City. Daylight mortgaged one of his Bonanza dumps with the Alaska Commercial Company and tucked the letter of credit into his pouch. Then he harnessed his dogs and went down on the ice at a pace that only he could travel. One Indian down, another Indian back, and four teams of dogs was his record. And at Forty Mile in Circle City he bought claims by the score. Many of these were to prove utterly worthless, but some few of them were to show up more astoundingly than any on Bonanza. He bought right and left, paying as low as fifty dollars and as high as five thousand. This highest one he bought in the Tivoli Saloon. It was an upper claim on El Dorado, and when he agreed to the price, Jacob Wilkins, an old-timer, just returned from a look at the moose pasture, got up and left the room, saying, Daylight, I've known you seven years, and you've always seemed sensible to now, and now you're just letting them rob you right and left. That's what it is, robbery. Five thousand for a claim on that damned moose pasture is bunco. I just can't stay in the room and see you buncoed that way. I tell you all, Daylight answered, Wilkins, Carmack strikes so big that we all can't see it all, 
It's a lottery. Every claim I buy is a ticket, and there's sure are going to be some capital prizes. Jacob Wilkins, standing in the open door, sniffed incredulously. Now supposing, Wilkins, daylight went on, supposing y'all knew it was going to rain soup. What'd y'all do? Buy spoons? Of course. Well, I'm sure buying spoons. She's going to rain soup up there on the Klondike, and them that has forks won't be catching none of it. But Wilkins here slammed the door behind him, and daylight broke off to finish the purchase of the claim. Back in Dawson, though he remained true to his word and never touched hand to pick and shovel, he worked as hard as ever in his life. He had a thousand irons in the fire, and they kept him busy. Representation work was expensive, and he was compelled to travel often over the various creeks in order to decide which claims should lapse and which should be retained. A quartz miner himself in his early youth, before coming to Alaska, he dreamed of finding the mother load. A placer camp he knew was ephemeral, while a quartz camp abided, and he kept a score of men in the quest for months. The mother load was never found, and years afterward he estimated that the search for it had cost him fifty thousand dollars. But he was playing big. Heavy as were his expenses, he won more heavily. He took lays, bought half shares, shared with men he grub-staked, and made personal locations. Day and night his dogs were ready, and he owned the fastest teams, so that when a stampede to a new discovery was on, it was burning daylight to the fore through the longest, coldest nights, till he blazed his stakes next to discovery. In one way or another, to say nothing of the many worthless creeks, he came into possession of properties on the good creeks, such as Sulphur, Dominion, Excelsis, Siwash, Crystal, Alhambra, and Doolittle. The thousands he poured out flowed back in tens of thousands. Forty-mile men told the story of his two tons of flour and made calculations of what it had returned him that ranged from a half a million to a million. One thing was known beyond all doubt, namely, that the half-share in the first Eldorado claim, bought by him for half a sack of flour, was worth five hundred thousand. On the other hand, it was told that when Frida, the dancer, arrived from over the passes in a Peterborough canoe in the midst of the drive of mush ice on the Yukon, and when she offered a thousand dollars for ten sacks and could find no sellers, he sent the flower to her as a present, without ever seeing her. In the same way, ten sacks were sent to the lone Catholic priest who was starting the first hospital. His generosity was lavish. Others called it insane. At a time when, riding his hunch, he was getting half a million for half a sack of flour, it was nothing less than insanity to give twenty whole sacks to a dancing girl and a priest. But it was his way. Money was only a marker. It was the game that counted with him. The possession of millions made little change in him, except that he played the game more passionately. Temperate as he had always been, save on rare occasions, now that he had the wherewithal for unlimited drink and had daily access to them, he drank even less. The most radical change lay in that, except when on the trail, he no longer did his own cooking. A broken-down miner lived in his log cabin with him and now cooked for him. But it was the same food, bacon, beans, flour, prunes, dried fruit, and rice. He still dressed as formerly, overalls, German socks, moccasins, flannel shirt, fur cap, and a blanket coat. He did not take up with cigars, which cost the cheapest, from half a dollar to a dollar each. The same Bull Durham 
and brown paper cigarette, hand-rolled, contented him. It was true that he kept more dogs, and paid enormous prices for them. They were not a luxury, but a matter of business. He needed speed in his traveling and stampeding, and by the same token he hired a cook. He was too busy to cook for himself, that was all. It was poor business, playing for millions, to spend time building fires and boiling water. Dawson grew rapidly that winter of 1896. Money poured in on daylight from the sale of town lots. He promptly invested it where it would gather more. In fact, he played the dangerous game of pyramiding, and no more perilous pyramiding than in a placer camp could be imagined. But he played with his eyes wide open. You all just wait till this news of the strike reaches the outside, he told his old-timer cronies in the Moosehorn Saloon. The news won't get out till next spring. Then there's going to be three rushes. A summer rush of men coming in light. A fall rush of men with outfits. And a spring rush the next year after that of 50,000. You all won't be able to see the landscape for Chichecos. Well, there's a summer and fall rush of 1897 to commence with. What are you all going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? A friend demanded. Nothing, he answered. I sure already done it. I got a dozen gangs strung out up the Yukon getting out logs. You all see their rafts coming down after the river breaks. Cabins, they'll sure be worth what a man can pay for them next fall. Lumber, it will sure go top-notch. I've got two sawmills freighting in over the passes. They'll come down as soon as the lake opens up. And if you all are thinking of needing lumber, I'll make you all contracts right now. Three hundred dollars a thousand, undressed. Corner lots in desirable locations were sold that winter for up to ten to thirty thousand dollars. Daylight sent word out over the trails and passes for the newcomers to bring down log rafts, and as a result, the summer of 1897 saw his sawmills working day and night on three shifts, and still he had logs left over with which to build cabins. These cabins, land included, sold from one to several thousand dollars. Two-story log buildings in the business part of town brought him from forty to fifty thousand dollars apiece. These fresh accretions of capital were immediately invested in other ventures. He turned gold over and over until everything that he touched seemed to turn to gold. But that first wild winter of Carmack strike taught daylight many things. Despite the prodigality of his nature, he had poise. He watched the lavish waste of the mushroom millionaires, and failed quite to understand it. According to his nature and outlook, it was all very well to toss an ante away in a night's frolic. That was what he had done the night of the poker game in Circle City, when he lost fifty thousand, all that he possessed. But he had looked on that fifty thousand as a mere ante. When it came to millions, it was different. Such a fortune was at stake and was not to be sown on barroom floors, literally sown, flung broadcast out of the moose-hide sacks by drunken millionaires who had lost all sense of proportion. There was McMahon, who ran up a single barroom bill of $38,000, and Jimmy the Rough, who spent one hundred thousand a month for four months in riotous living, and then fell down drunk in the snow one March night, and was frozen to death. And Swiftwater Bill, who, after spending three valuable claims in an extravagance of debauchery, borrowed three thousand dollars with which to leave the country, and who, out of this sum, because the lady love that jilted him liked eggs, 
cornered the one hundred and ten dozen eggs on the Dawson market, paying twenty-four dollars a dozen for them and promptly feeding them to the wolf dogs. Champagne sold at forty to fifty dollars a quart, and canned oyster stew at fifteen dollars. Daylight indulged in no such luxuries. He did not mind treating a barroom of men to whiskey at fifty cents a drink. But there was somewhere in his own extravagant nature a sense of fitness and arithmetic that revolted against paying fifteen dollars for the contents of an oyster can. On the other hand, he possibly spent more money in relieving hard luck cases than did the wildest of the new millionaires on insane debauchery. Father Judge of the hospital could have told of far more important donations than that first ten sacks of flour. Old-timers who came to daylight invariably went away relieved according to their need. But fifty dollars for a quart of fizzy champagne, that was appalling. And yet he still, on occasion, made one of his old-time hell-roaring nights, but he did so for different reasons. First, it was expected of him, because it had been his way in the old days, and second, he could afford it. But he no longer cared quite so much for that form of diversion. He had developed, in a new way, the taste for power. It had become a lust with him. By far the wealthiest miner in Alaska, he wanted to be still wealthier. It was a big game he was playing in, and he liked it better than any other game. In a way, the part he played was creative. He was doing something, and at no time, striking another chord of his nature, could he take the joy in a million-dollar El Dorado dump that was at all equivalent to the joy he took in watching his two sawmills working and the big downriver log rafts swinging into the bank in the big eddy just above Moosehide Mountain. Gold, even on the scales, was, after all, an abstraction. It represented things and the power to do. But the sawmills were the things themselves, concrete and tangible. And they were things that were a means to the doing of more things. They were dreams come true, hard and indubitable realizations of fairy gossamers. With the summer rush from the outside came special correspondents for the big newspapers and magazines, and one and all, using unlimited space, they wrote daylight up, so that, as far as the world was concerned, daylight loomed the largest figure in Alaska. Of course, after several months, the world became interested in the Spanish War, and forgot all about him, but in the Klondike itself daylight still remained the most prominent figure. Passing along the streets of Dawson, all heads turned to follow him, and in the saloons, Chichacos watched him awesomely, scarcely taking their eyes from him as long as he remained in their range of vision. Not alone was he the richest man in the country, but he was Burning Daylight, the pioneer, the man who, almost in the midst of antiquity of that young land, had crossed the Chilkoot and drifted down the Yukon to meet those elder giants, Al Mayo and Jack McQuestion. He was the burning daylight of scores of wild adventures, the man who carried word to the ice-bound whaling fleet across the tundra wilderness to the Arctic Sea, who raced the mail from Circle to Saltwater and back again in sixty days, who saved the whole Tanana tribe from perishing in the winter of ninety-one. In short, the man who smote the Chikekos imaginations more violently than any other dozen men rolled into one. He had the fatal facility for self-advertisement. Things he did, no matter how adventurous or spontaneous, struck the popular imagination as remarkable. 
and the latest thing he had done was always on men's lips. Whether it was being first in the heartbreaking stampede to Danish Creek, in killing the record bald-faced grizzly over on Sulphur Creek, or in winning the single paddle canoe race on the Queen's birthday, after being forced to participate at the last moment by the failure of the sourdough representative to appear. Then, one night, in the moose horn, he locked horns with Jack Kearns in the long-promised return game of poker. The sky and eight o'clock in the morning were made the limits, and at the close of the game, Daylight's winnings were two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. To Jack Kearns, already several times millionaire, this loss was not vital, but the whole community was thrilled by the size of the stakes, and each one of the dozen correspondents in the field sent out a sensational article. End of Part 1 Chapter 11